You're afraid to ask your crush out. You must be a teenager. When I was a teenager, I was always afraid to talk to girls. Um, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that, and this kind of served me well as I got older too, is that people can, can read each other really well. There's a lot of communication that can happen without verbal communication. So your eyes, your body, your hands, everything, it says a lot. In fact, it's probably saying more than you could say with your own voice. So You can't really improve your IQ, unfortunately. <laughs> Just be happy with what you got. The thing about quote-unquote smart people is that they tend to get very overconfident. And some of the smartest people I've met, or most effective people I've met, are not the smartest people I know. The smartest people I know often will get in their own way. They'll focus on the wrong things. They'll be too timid or nervous or anxious. It'd be nice to have the combination of everything, but quite frankly, even with the people that are really smart um, and are, have good personalities, at least like effective for business, oftentimes they'll have ethical issues or other things like that. So it's hard to be a perfect person. You just have to take a look at your entire, you know, your entire package. I don't even think who your father is is that important, to be honest. You know, people. I always meet people who their fathers are somebody important, and they often end up being the most disappointing people. They're just coasting on their dad's name. You know, you got to be your own man or woman or person. You see, part part of this new wokeness is I just don't want to go back to jail. So I promise, I'm, I'm woke now. Don't take me to jail. Can someone replicate what you did, becoming a public CEO, little to no educational or professional experience? Well, I mean, if you look at some of the greatest entrepreneurs of years past, they also didn't have any experience. So, you know, it'd been weird to tell Mark Zuckerberg, well, you're all right, but, you know, you should go work at IBM or Microsoft or HP for a couple of years. He made a company worth more than HP or IBM, you know, so he's going to get the experience uh, at a less successful company. So it's just a little bizarre. You know, so every now and then you get people who are really good at what they do, really understand the world and really have an opportunity and go with it. It's rare, um, and it's unlikely. Focus on your assignments more? Well, I think you have to close your eyes and ask yourself, do I want to be successful? And if the answer is no, then do whatever you want. But if the answer is yes, you have to take your assignments seriously and get to work and stop being lazy. You, you know, having you have to trust in, in the syllogism that is your future. If I work hard, then I will be successful. And if I'm successful, then I will achieve my goals. You know, if you don't trust in every piece of that syllogism, you will fail. So the reason that you're not working hard is because you have lost faith in the syllogism. You either don't think that you will, you either don't believe that if you work hard, you'll be successful, or you don't believe that if you'll be successful, that it's worth it, that it's worth it because you may or may not be happy, even if you do become successful. But most people have a problem with the first part of the syllogism, that they don't trust that if they work hard, that they'll actually be successful. So what you have to do, I think, is self-actualize and imagine being successful. What does that look like and feel like? And then work backwards to doing the little thing you don't want to do, like making your bed or whatever the case is. I think programming you could do either way. You can go to university and you'll learn a certain way and you'll have certain drawbacks. And if you do it yourself, you'll learn a certain way and you'll have other drawbacks. So there's sort of like a trade-offs you have to make. Those trade-offs you know, will be pretty obvious. If I had to pick a programming-related job, um, it depends on what kind of programming you like to do. You know, for, for front-end, I would certainly be a web developer. For back-end, I'd just learn all the databases I could. But those are only two areas. There's a lot more than that. Um, that's a good question. I, I think that if you're stuck and you don't know what game you want to play in life, then it's okay to spend a little time kind of wandering and being... Uh, in a days. Some people call that their 20s. And it's okay if you're doing that in your 30s or your 40s. Um, but eventually you should kind of decide, okay, this is really what I want to be good at. And I'm only saying this because this is like an optimal way to sort of exist in today's capitalist society. If you want to do something else, that's, you know, who might I tell you otherwise? Some people want to know a little bit about a lot of things. 
But the people who want to know a lot about a lot of things, like me, it's kind of an exhausting, difficult, and basically impossible task. And I find myself regretting it. <laughs> um, I do know a lot about a lot, but I also am sh always struggle to keep up. You know, I, I don't have time to do all the things that I'd like to do. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, value in freedom. You know, the freedom to be able to do whatever you want at any time. The freedom to pick up, you know, a journal and read it cover to cover. And if you want to know a lot about a lot, you're not going to have that kind of freedom. You know, you're going to miss things and the opportunity for lateral thinking and other exposure to interesting ideas may be limited. And you may actually paradoxically end up doing less, even though you're trying to do so much more. So you have to find a way to be focused, but also flexible. And it's very difficult. I mean, there's no easy answer. I do think you have to have a good mind state, you know, no matter what. You have to be really uh, interested in efficiency and interested in like, you know, very, very, you know, good, healthy lifestyle, which is not always easy to do. I eat very poorly and I don't exercise very much. So that's my, my issues right there. But some people do other things, you know, they self-medicate, they drink too much or they have depression or whatever the case is, it limits them from, from achieving what they want to achieve. And by the time one looks in the mirror and says, okay, wait a second, I've been, I've been messing up or something like that. It's uh, it's too late. You know, passion can be cringy because my passion, your passion might be different, but you know, uh, Balmer is a very high energy kind of guy. But if you get passionate about designing DNA primers or you get passionate about, you know, reading Chaucer or you get passionate about critical race theory, you know, that's your choice, you know, whatever you're passionate about, you know, it, it shouldn't be, it might be cringe to everyone else, but if it's, that's what you like, then I'm not going to make fun of you. I admire somebody with passion. So few people have it. So many people are nihilists and cynics and, you know, the downtrodden souls of this modern era. It's easy to get sad. But I have a zest, a verve, a love, a joie de vivre that's incomparable. I love life. No, nothing can get me down. Let me do some push-ups, man. I'm ready to go to war with China, bro. Let's go. Are we ready? Who's ready? Who's ready? I'm ready for war with China. Let's go. Who's ready? Everyone do 25 push-ups. Make America great again. I wouldn't learn any technical analysis, but it doesn't hurt to learn quantitative investing. Quantitative investing is not that different from other forms of investing. It's just kind of, you still have to use your brain. You know, you don't just shove everything into a computer and say, okay, go, go computer, go. You know, it's more complicated than that. Technical analysis though, is just the idea you could look at some stock chart and then figure out the future from the stock charts is nonsense. Any price chart. I'm sure someone's out there saying, yes, but yes, I can. Yes, I can. It's like, okay, dude, go ahead. Do it, conquer the world. There's an infinite amount of money out there for people who want to make, who can make money and will help other people make money. And I mean, like through a fund or something like that. There's no shortage of global wealth. There's $400 trillion of, of wealth out there for people that want to, uh, for more than that, actually. Uh, no, around 400 trillion of, of money out there. And every single person, every single dollar wants their money to go up more. So if you can do it, God bless you. You'll find, you'll find people who, who will give you money. But you'll have to do it sustainably over and over again for many years. And I suspect that that's going to be very difficult to do. But again, to each their own. You know, my friend had dinner with Warren Buffett. And he asked Warren Buffett about Soros. He asked Warren Buffett about uh, Renaissance. He asked Warren Buffett about all these other investors who were, were demonstrably really, really good investors. 
like irrefutably good. And he said he's happy for all of them. He doesn't care. He doesn't pay attention. To them. He just does him. You know, I just do me. But it, it's, it's a serious point. Um, you have to be content with your method, not look around and say, oh, I want to try that method too. Oh, no, no, I want to try that method too. You don't see Jay-Z looking at Taylor Swift and saying, oh, man, I'm so jealous of all Taylor Swift's record sales. Let me go be a pop country artist. And then he turns around and says, oh, whoa, man, Charlie Puth's doing really well. Let me work on my vocals. You know, it doesn't make sense. You don't see Tom Brady saying, man, that Ronaldo, he's making a lot of money. I, I gotta go try, gotta go try playing that game. Maybe be really good at your game, you know. And, and it's hard because you don't realize you probably suck at your game. You know, that's the the reality. And so focusing on on excelling at one thing is, is something people don't want to do. They want to excel at ten things, and it's you know, excel at one thing and master it, and then maybe, just maybe, then you can start to even think about. Thing number two. But I'm talking 20 years after, not like right away. So impatience is really important. Even my dad knew that. My dad was telling me that from day one. Patience. Patience, my son. Um, I think that the family values of certain races have created this economic disparity. That's an unpopular thing to say, but if you look at the stereotype of Asian culture and the stereotype of black culture and the stereotype of just what those families expect and what some of those families values are, they're very different. And I certainly am not saying one is better than the other, but I think you can't be blind to seeing just how sort of studious and dedicated that, you know, Asian Americans in particular, who are now the number one earners in, in America. So there's this work ethic, there's a valuing of education, there's all kinds of stuff like that that contributes. It doesn't mean that things are fair. It doesn't really mean a lot in general. It just means it's something to think about. Kind of dedication and focus to education, respecting of elders, respect for authority, something I don't do very well. Um, all of those things are uh, more important in some of those cultures than others. And I think that it's not a surprise when you see those examples set for families. What happens, again, not, not a, it's not always positive. Albanian culture is very unique. <laughs> I, Albanians are very independent and a bit uh, hard to control. They definitely don't respect authority very much. And again, these are stereotypes. Every individual person is unique. Hard-headed is right. That's uh, Victor Bedishai. Bedishai? Hard-headed is 100% right. And not all Albanians are friendly. I still think the revenue and earnings are more important than that. And I'd rather take a less diverse company with a lot more earnings than a diverse company with less earnings. And maybe that's not very woke, but that's my opinion. Uh, but if you can, you can have diversity, it's not a bad thing. I would agree if, if the, they're competent, they're competent, who really cares? But you want some, again, you, you have to have been a manager or maybe even the CEO to understand a little bit the dynamic here where I, I, cer I certainly see a lot of people who just working with me will probably make them a millionaire. I want those people to be to be a diverse group because everybody should have that that chance. I guess you know maybe again maybe that's lame or too woke or whatever. But I always enjoy seeing somebody who didn't think that they could really make it because you know they're whatever they weren't getting chances you know as many chances as somebody else. I don't know it brings a smile to my face when when I see that. Kind of like rooting for the underdog to some extent. But again, it's not my main focus. I mean, some people that's like all they care about, you know, to me, I really care about performance. You know, that's it. You know, if the person can't perform, I'm not going to hire them, <laughs> period, the end. You know, but it, it is nice to have uh, a diverse crew. I mean, I, it just personally makes me happy, to be honest. I, uh, you don't see a lot of minorities in pharmaceuticals. 
for example. So, you know, if I have a chance to, again, maybe it sounds weird, but I don't know. I just kind of have a chance to mentor a black executive and watch that person really blossom and succeed and become rich. That makes me happy. You know, it makes me happy when they're white too, you know, but it's, uh, you know, it's something that I think is cool. Can't explain why, but you know, it just is. I think it's like that underdog syndrome to some extent. You know, it it sort of sucks to me that you know that whatever is happening in society makes you know there's you know very 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 few people in pharma or in tech that are black or women or you know all kinds of things like that. And I don't know, it just kind of sucks. But again, it's not my. It's not like my raison d'etre, you know, my be all end all that like this matters to me. It doesn't really, you know, it's just a idiosyncratic opportunity. I'm not, I've never been woke. Uh, I think woke is silly, but I do. I did grow up in a very multicultural environment in Brooklyn um, where other races were just something, you know, was routinely in school with very diverse you know, groups of people and things like that. So I'm not, I think a lot of people who are anti-woke are, are actually kind of closet racist <laughs> and, you know, I'm anti-woke, but not racist. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, 90% of people who are anti-woke are not racist, but there are some people who are anti-woke that are racist. And, you know, I think it's okay to talk about and think about race without, uh, you know, quote unquote, being woke. I mean, there are racial issues in the country. Uh, I happen to think that they're not as bad as other people think, which makes me kind of anti-woke. <laughs> uh, but again, we can uh, exactly uh, this guy uh, Khan has a funny point here: is that when you're really level-headed and you don't uh, uh, give in to mob culture one way or the other, you know, you get hated by both sides. So I'm definitely hated by the woke side, but you know, getting risk risking being hated by the anti-woke side by but not being anti-woke enough. Anyway, let's stick, let's stick to software. I, I am consulting for some people, uh, selectively consulting. Um, you can email me at martin at martinscrelly.com, but I don't take all uh, assignments. I just help out people I like and certainly happy to look into whatever for the right fee, if, if I have time which I have very little. I do think there's too much virtue signaling in America. That's why you've never heard me say something like what I just said before. I do it quietly. I don't have to, you know, uh, broadcast that I'm mentoring black executives, you know, it is not all of them are going to make it. Some of them will, will make it. Some of them won't just like white executives who I also mentor. But I do particularly enjoy it when, when I see somebody who maybe society didn't expect to become very successful, become successful, but you know, I don't have to broadcast that from the, the rooftops like a lot of other woke people do, right? They have to, they make it the centerpiece of their company or their life or whatever. And, you know, you, you know, it's often the people that are speaking the loudest that have the most to hide. You know, some of the most woke guys uh, that I know in, in business never talk about it. They just do it, you know, which is a big difference. Uh, one example is actually Andreessen Horowitz, who has a community fund, a community improvement fund, basically, for black entrepreneurs. They never really talk about it, but that's how you, how you help society, you know, in my opinion. Uh, you have to do something. You know, all, this, all these guys that put out press releases, and, you know, Salesforce is one of these woke companies, extremely woke. Um, they give out a, at every conference, they... they they host like Dreamforce. They give out a badge that has your pronouns on your badge, so you can twist the uh, pronouns from he him to her she her to they them. So you have this like three three different uh, three different pin on a pin that you you know you can twist them. I think I have one somewhere. Um, I got to go find it. Uh, I think building a company is a lot better for, for building wealth. Uh, but it's all dependent on your style. I mean, if you like to uh, trade, then maybe trading's better. 
you know, one of my colleagues asked me to do a very mundane task yesterday and I got so mad because uh, I'm still like halfway in my jail mode. So they asked me to do something like really trivial, like send an email to somebody. And I got, I got really mad because, um, I was like, well, what do they think I am? I have to send this email out. I'm going to keep it real. And then I realized that, you know, I'm not in jail anymore. And this is the way the corporate world works. And I should probably calm down and send the email. And, uh, you know, it was just a funny reminder that, you know, um, you can get very acclimated to a certain environment. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm glad to not be in that environment anymore. But, uh, you know, when you keep it real, too real, you, things can go wrong very quickly. Institutionalized, totally, <laughs> totally. I met people who are in jail for 30 years. They're just straight crazy. One of the guys I met in jail was in there for, um, all right, get this. This guy got a two-year sentence. Right, goes to jail, gets into a fight, gets 30 years on top of his two years. You had to keep it real. You can't let somebody make you a punk. God forbid somebody insults you and you don't retaliate. Now you're a punk. So he kills a guy and he gets 30 years. Whoops. My bad. And then um, I meet the guy and yeah, he's out of his mind. And I get to know his bunkmate as well, who's a cool kid from New York, a uh, bit of a troublemaker, but nice guy. And, um, the bunk mate comes to me one day and is like, man, my, my bunkie's going crazy. And I'm like, what's wrong? And it, he said, well, I, uh, moved some of the stuff on our shared bench and he saw it and he flipped out. He said, why'd you move my stuff? What'd you do to my stuff? Did you take my stuff? <laughs> and, and the guy was like ready to kill him because like ultimately to this guy, that cell is his house, you know? So if you're, you're messing around with somebody's house, you know, it's kind of a crazy thing, you know, to, to me or to my friend, this isn't our house. It's like being in a bad hotel for way too long of a stay. But to him, no, that's, that's his, some people even call it their crib. You'd say, oh, it, I would say, come to the cell, come to my cell, I-20 or whatever. And um, some of the other guys in the prison would be like, all right, meet me in my crib in five minutes. Crib? This is not your crib? <laughs> crib? <laughs> when you grow a big enough company, you get people who have drug problems, alcohol problems, actually. You get people, I had one person who had some weird schizophrenia or something, and she emailed the whole company email. We had like everyone at shkrellydrugcompany.com, and she emailed everyone. Or maybe she just added everyone one by one. But man, that thing was crazy. She had to be uh, hospitalized. I, I didn't even know this person. She's like an assistant to somebody. She said she was going to smear our blood on the walls or something. It was really like, whoa. <laughs> but when you get a big enough company like that, it was wild. Um, one of my close friends, uh, well, I won't talk about that. That's another thing that happens over time. Learn some of my old friends passing away. You know, that that's a real sad situation. But, you know, it happens when you're getting older, you know. Can't do much about it. I had any philosophy books I liked. Um, Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, been pretty good. Um, and then uh, Quantum Computing Since Democritus uh, by Aronson. Those are really like science books. Um, interesting book from a long time ago um, called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I think it's the best-selling philosophy book ever. Um, could be worth worth a read if you like it. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Persig. Determinism versus free will. Good question. Um, I think that you know there there's an obvious you know we obviously have uh, uh, free will. You know you can choose to do whatever you want. You can you're watching this video. You can go watch twerking. I'm actually going to stop streaming and watch Amaranth right now anyway. So I was trying to make a cabin out of birch logs and it ended up looking like bird shit because there's no texture pack. And I understand there's like this, this meta of like, well, maybe because of, I, <laughs> it's not why do I like her so much, it's why does the whole world like her so much? But um, she's just famous. Um, and I don't, obviously don't like her that much, but um, I mean, I wouldn't be kicking her out of my house, but I won't say that I have a lot of models and DMs. I mean, that's not what I prioritize for. If I wanted to be like flashy, 
online. I would post pictures of watches and private jets and stuff like that. And then I'm sure I'd get more followers. And when you have more followers, more models hit you up and stuff like that. And it's just a silly game of, of clout. I don't know that it would make you more happy. Um, I like things that a lot of people don't like. You know, I like difficult problems. I like math and physics. I like chemistry. I like computer programming. I like video games. You know, these are not the things that make you very famous uh, online. And that attention chasing and clout chasing is um, not something I'm going to go out and try to do. Um, I certainly don't mind it if, if it happens, but I get a lot of intelligent women who are successful, who work at big hedge funds or work at, um, or have their own startups. You know, that's the kind of, uh, or just otherwise just intelligent women that uh, are not cloud chasing, cloud chasers generally at least. Um, back in 2015, I'd say it was a bit of a different story, um, but I was also a bit of a different person. You know, I, I found myself becoming less, um, I don't know, just less like, less interested in that kind of stuff, you know, but I'm glad you're a fan of rehabilitation because I think, um, people do make mistakes, good people. And, uh, it's important to remember that even criminals are still humans. And uh, mistakes, uh, bad judgment, uh, can be a victim of sometimes of your circumstances too. We're all kind of held hostage by our emotions and our minds, and I think it's easy to get uh, caught up in bad behavior.